Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, the triumphal entry. When they came, or when they approached Jerusalem, and they came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied, and with her a colt. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, that, uh, to you, you shall say to them, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, saying to the daughters of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of bird. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey, the colt, and laid their coats on them and sat him on them. And most of the crowd spread their clothes on the road and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds gathered ahead of him and there were those who followed shouting, Hosanna to the King of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. I note a couple of things, first of all, and that is the strange phrase that Jesus uses. And that the disciples repeat, the Lord has need. Stop and consider who is speaking. This is God. What does God have need of? The answer really, nothing. God is self-sufficient in himself. What is there that you and I could truly do for him? If God needed a prayer answer, why would he come and ask you? Why would he not just take care of himself? Yet we see this phrase, the Lord has need. Now I suppose the Lord maybe directly doesn't have a need, but sometimes his church here below and his people here below too. This week, we were blessed by God. We got three letters, actually two letters, three envelopes, came in Wednesday night. The first two I hold here with me today. They came in and their requests for prayer. And accompanying each of these was $25. Would you please pray, we will, please pray for this, and would you please pray for this. Each of those requests, as I said, accompanied by $25. And there was a third envelope. So I opened the third envelope. No letter. Just a check for $1,050. No name, no information, nothing. Just Mountain View Baptist Church, a cashier's check made out for $1,050. These words... The Lord has need. I, I, there's no other way to explain this gift. It came from the city of Temecula. Between Temecula and here, there are a great number of churches. Many of those churches, of course, much larger than our own. If somebody wanted to give, I suppose they could have just given to those. But the Lord knew that there was a need here. The Lord had need of that $1,050 here at Mountain View. And he touched the heart of somebody, some man, some woman, they wrote a check, made it out to Mountain View Baptist Church. The Lord has need. Now maybe God doesn't him in person have a need, but he knew this is church, his body. We are the body of Christ, and we did have a need for that money. There are costs incurred in maintaining a church. And so I just want you to see that on this week, God was thoughtful of this, his church. And of you, his people. And the 11th, the biggest offering we've ever taken on Wednesday night, $1,100 we deposited that Wednesday night. Praise the Lord for that. 
that was wonderful. It reminds us that God's watching. I tell you often that Jesus Christ has entered into this building and he stands here in the very center of us. That's his promise. If two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the middle. And he definitely was with us as we prayed or began to pray for Wednesday night. But this has nothing really to do with my sermon, the triumphal entry. My message is found really in the 10th verse of chapter 21. And in fact, it is really comes down to just this question. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? Who is this? It is a question that was asked then. First of all, let's take a look at this question. The question, very simple, who is this? As the crowds come out of the city, they had heard, many in the city had heard of the resurrection of Lazarus. They had heard of a man just a few miles away who died was dead for four days, in the tomb for four days. And lying there in that tomb, suddenly a man called Jesus came to the city, asked to be taken to the tomb. Standing outside the tomb, he would say, Lazarus, come forth. And suddenly from within the tomb, the dead man breathed again the breath of life, walked out of that tomb and into the open and into the arms of his sisters who still weeping from their loss. And suddenly there's their own brother to comfort them. And the city was just amazed at it. Jesus, just the Friday before this, would have gone and had a dinner in the house of Mary and Lazarus. And so the crowd begins to hear the story, begins to spread through the people about a man named Jesus who raised the dead. The story now goes, and of course, many of those from Galilee, where Jesus had performed the majority of his miracles, where he had performed the majority of his preaching, many from Galilee followed him. And those from Galilee coming behind, those in the city of Jerusalem hearing of his approach, come to the gates to begin to see him, to try and see him, to begin to hear what it is that he has to say. And the question begins to spread throughout the crowd. Who is this? Who is this? Uh, actually, it's a question really that has a twofold impact, I suppose. It was asked then, 2,000 years ago in the city of Jerusalem. All the city was saying, who is this? This was a crowded city. Nero, who lived shortly about this time, estimated or had a census taken and found that there were 2,700,000 people in the city of Jerusalem at the time of the Passover. 2,700,000 people could have been expected to be in Jerusalem on this particular day, and it is said that the city was stirred. It was shaken. It was moved. And they were all moved. They were all shaken. They were all stirred by one question. Who is this? A man riding on a donkey. In the Orient, this is the picture of a king who would be coming to accept his crown. It was not a king in this particular case who was coming to a palace, but rather to his spiritual palace, the temple. Jesus would ride that donkey right up to the very gates of the temple where he was about one more time to cleanse that temple as he did in the beginning of his ministry. He would do here at the end. Who is this? This procession, I suppose, 
may have seemed somewhat strange. You can imagine the high priests were questioning. You can imagine the royal courtiers were questioning. Herod was in town. Pilate was in town. All of them wondering, who is this man? What is this that's going on today that has stirred my city? What is this that they go out and they shout, Hosanna to the son of David? Are they planning on crowning a king? Are they hoping to remove us? That question that was asked of the ancients is still being asked even today. I suppose it could be said that all the world has been moved saying, who is this? The procession, the procession rather passed. As Jesus passed through the city and the town, as Jesus made his way up the hill and into Jerusalem and finally coming to rest there at the temple. This procession had passed. But the processional event would continue. It would not be long before they would crucify in another profession or procession this man. This man would be dead and he would be buried. And some thought that perhaps the procession had ended. But wait. Soon there's news. News of another resurrection. Not only of a resurrection, but the news of the ascension of Jesus Christ. Though he was dead, he overcame death in the grave. He went one more time. He left as he came from heaven, so he returned. And we have the story of the ascension of Jesus Christ. The gift of the Spirit is given. The call of men to believe. A story perhaps of one of nine wonderful days? No. For this story has spread from land to land and from age to age. It survived 300 years of the harshest of persecutions. It rose again fresh from the wreck of the Roman Empire. I suppose this procession has moved on through time and has even changed the very current of thought created new institutions. I suppose to some degree it helped to form the nations of the world today. But I have to think that its greatest effect is down deep inside of men. Not just on what we see, but what lies beneath. What other men do not see. The principles. The characters. The work ethic. The lives. And to some degree, I suppose, even the deaths. Those who have passed on before, death was changed. For death is no longer the end, but simply a doorway to the beginning. Those who have died in Christ stand with him today in a new procession in the new Jerusalem. It would not be unfair to say that he has become a universal presence, this Christ. A vast, mysterious power in our world. Who is this? People ask still even today. What account can we give for the fact that he has changed the world so fundamentally? Who is this? The question is asked. This question which is reopened throughout the ages, it comes fresh again from time to time as people grow weary of religion, his own day, 
So it is today in our day, which is still his day, for he is alive. And men still have the question in their mind, who is this? So let us then consider the answer. The answer to this question, as it is given in Scripture, as it has been believed by the faithful, Really, it comes to us in four simple steps. First, it is said in his very own day, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth. I suppose the simplest thing to believe of Jesus Christ, very little argument about whether or not he was a prophet, whether or not he was a teacher, those who would deny his deity do not deny the fact that he was a teacher, that he was a prophet. His enemies would refer to him that way. The first impression that is rudimentary, I suppose, upon his disciples and his world was his prophetic mission. The evidence, the statements, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. But the world knew. For the Pharisees would say, we know that thou art a teacher sent from God. His enemies would have to agree. Because no one says what you say. No one can do what you do unless God sent him. So we know that you are a teacher sent by God. It has been said that a great prophet has arisen This was heard to be said throughout Jerusalem. This is of a truth that prophet. If so, his witness of himself is true. For he was a prophet. He is the prophet, priest, and king. His early followers, even his enemies, knew that he was a prophet. And so one of the first things that you and I might learn of Christ is that he's a prophet. But it doesn't end there. For you notice that this is the Christ. If it's true, what he said, if he was the teacher come from God, if he was that prophet, and what he said was true, then this is the Christ, the foreordained one, the one bearing the office and achieving the work that was described by the prophecy. You can go to uh, Psalm chapter 22. There is a huge prophecy of Christ. It tells all about his death. How he was pierced. How that he was hung. An exact description. Even the words that he would speak on the cross are contained there in Psalm 22. So he is that prophet. And if he is that prophet, then... He is the Redeemer. The one who is the hope of Israel and of all mankind. This becomes the first conviction of every Christian. Lord Jesus, we will say, I know I know that you are a Savior. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior, my Christ, my ordained one, who was ordained to seek and to save that which is lost, the one who was ordained to call me from my sin into heaven. This prophet, this 
Christ, this Redeemer. God has made the same Jesus. This is what the New Testament proclaimed. This is what early Christianity and later Christianity, what we hold true. For God has made this same Jesus both Lord and Christ. What is it that you and I do in our lives except for make him both Lord and Christ? Lord Jesus, save me. We fulfilled this when we call upon you. When we asked for salvation, we made this thing true. But as I said, there are four parts to this. And the, the third one is quite simple. If he is the prophet, if he is the Christ, then he is the Son of God. This Christ, that's the belief of the early church. Who are you? Peter said, Jesus asks this question to his disciples. Who do men say that I am? Well, some say you're the prophet. Some say you're this and some say you're that. But who do you say I am? Wow. You're the Christ. The only begotten of the Father. Okay. So, if then he is the prophet, and if the prophet is the Christ, then the Christ is the Son of God. That's what he had said. If he's the Christ, meaning that he is the Lord, then his prophecy or his declaration that he was the Son of God, that the Father and I are one, holds true. And if it's true, he is the Christ. First of all, I declare to you that he declared this. Look at Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. I tell you of the decree, the Lord said unto me, Thou art my Son, this day I have begotten thee. It is declared not just by Christ, but by his Father, and it was recorded years before he ever came. David, the great ancestor of Christ, would record these words, and Christ would speak them to the crowd. I tell you the decree. The Lord said unto me, Jesus says, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Jesus quoted that very verse to the crowd when they were arguing as to who he was. Not only is it declared, but it's also understood. Look at John chapter 6 and verse 69. And we have believed and know that thou art the Holy One of God. That's a Christian standard. We know that thou art the Holy One of God. This is something that we not only declared, but we understand it too. We don't just say it, we believe it. We know it to be true. But it was also not only declared, understood, but also witnessed. Look at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 17. And lo, a voice out of heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. When he was baptized, the heavens opened. The dove came down. Christ standing in the water and the Father speaking from heaven. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all present at that one occasion. And what is it that the Father witnessed? The Holy Spirit witnessed by descending. John said, I will know who he is because the Spirit, like a dove, will descend and rest upon him. That happened. And then, of course, the Father's own witness. The Father's own witness. This is my beloved Son. Hear Him. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. All three witnessed who Jesus Christ is. And finally, it was preached. Acts chapter 9 and verse 20. And straightway in the synagogue he proclaimed Jesus, that he was, or that he is, the Son of God. And straightway they went to the synagogue and they preached Jesus. They proclaimed 
Jesus. What did they proclaim about him? What is it that the first servants of Christ contain? That he is the Son of God. This is the foundation. This was his triumphal entry. This is why he marched in. The king is coming. If he is the king, he is that prophet. If he is that prophet, he is that Christ. If he is that Christ, he is the Son of God. And fourthly, he is the Word. He is the Word who was with God in the beginning. As John would say, who was with God and who is God. If he is the Christ, he is then not only the Son of God, but he is God. He is one with the Father. He is the one, according to Paul, by whom Paul and John both proclaim that he is the one who created all things and that by him all things consist. There is nothing that is made that was not made by him, Jesus Christ. Christ, not only our Savior, but our Creator, the Giver of of life. The one who breathed into the nostrils of man and he became a living soul. No wonder he gave you your first breath. No wonder he says, I can give to you new life. This word is God blessed forever. He was the light and the life of man. Therefore, he is their Redeemer and our eternal life. The questions, the answers, and the conclusion. If this Jesus, and I speak not only to those in this room, but to those listening through the internet, if you should meet this Jesus as the disciples did, and if he should approach you as he did them and should ask the same question that he asked of his twelve, who do men say that I am? What would you say? I suppose you could tell him what men say. Some say, Others say, but then he stands a little closer to you, looks you in the eye, maybe even puts his hand on your shoulder, and then he asks, but who do you say? Who do you say? Who do you say that I am? Be careful. For heaven or hell are found in your answer. If he is the Christ, then he is God. And if he is God, you owe him something. What is it that he would ask? What is it that God asks of men? Oh, you would say, our faith, yes, but more than your faith, he asks for your life. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Who do you say that he is? The thief on the cross had a very simple answer. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what was the promise made to that man? Today you will be with me in paradise. If you would be willing today to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then as that thief on the cross received his reward that afternoon, you can receive yours too.